Let me tell you a little story about uh, a use case that we had in Norway. So this uh, story um, is about these transformer stations, which we have um, everywhere where we have power systems, but it basically is, it, they look like little huts, maybe something like this. There are different variations of them. Uh, they might look like, let's say, this one, or they, they might look like, um, they might actually also blend nicely into the 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 uh, environment, like this one, for example. So these are so-called transformer station, and it isn't really important um, what they look like, but what is important is that these have previously been standing in the field and have had very little connectivity to the the rest of the world. So in in a for example our um, our um, um, uh, use case that or in the use case that I'm going to uh, show you, we had you know, two thousands or so of these stations sitting out in the field, and each one of these have a set of equipment in it. One of the pieces of equipment that sits in here is an advanced monitor of the power and and of course the actual transformer, and that's really a so-called PLC, a pro programmable logic controller, that has been monitoring uh, whatever is happening on this transformer, but that data has never been sent up to the the head office. So let's say this is the head office over here of of the power company, and so this data has never been sent up. The the the, the different um, transformer station are actually hooked up on a private network that looks something like this that goes through um, fiber actually all the way to the transformer station but no one really picked up this data no one read it no one analyzed it so it's just sitting out there in the field and even this simple PLC is producing as much as 25 megabytes per hour Right? That's quite a lot of data, and maybe some of this data is useful. They just don't know. So what are the problems that you know we might be able to help with if we were to see this data? Well, one of the things that is happening is that we're trying to improve the uptime of the net itself. Right now, I think they're at 99.95% or something like that, or 99.5%, I don't remember. They really want to get to 99. Uh, nine, 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 well, so-called six nines of availability. Uh, if they don't have availability, at least at four nines, they will start being penalized by the government. So the theory is that these 25 megabytes that sits over here, that we would be able to, if we can collect that from all these 2000 stations, we might be able to do something useful with them. That's the initial theory. So the question is, how do you do that? Well, I said that they were connected by fiber. It's not entirely true. There are some of these machines whose connection is a little bit more challenging. These, these uh, could, for instance, be connected with 3G mobile nets or 4G or LTE. Uh, so the, the expense of taking that data and put it, getting it up to the head office could be an issue, but probably not too bad. Maybe we get enough data from those that are hooked up to fiber to, to you know, gleam some usefulness. Maybe there are some rolling um, blackouts, or maybe there are some spikes in the network. Um, but this is the original use case. You know, can we collect this data, and can we do something useful with it? So. Our thoughts then was as follows, that what we want to do is we want to put a machine in every one of these um, huts. So if you can imagine, uh, if I bring up one of these machines again, um, let's see, or one of these, let's say this one. Uh, inside this, this, this hut, there is plenty of space. So our thoughts were maybe we could put some kind of computer in here. You know, maybe if I put a little box in here, let's just say I put one in here somewhere on the wall right here, 
let's call it the protexo box uh, maybe if I put a protexo box in here and um, if I were to connect that to this mod bus that sits over here or with, to the PLC the, the actual protocol is mod bus and maybe I can hook up to some other sensors in here maybe I can have a door sensor right here that might be useful to know you know wh where we visited Oh, there's are no scheduled maintenance no one should open this door this is, might be a problem and so on so if I put a box in there I'll be able to collect all this data and maybe I can do something with it uh, if nothing else maybe I can just send it up to the head office but remember that there's quite a lot of data here right we, we were talking about 25 25 gigabytes per uh, hour right and if you multiply that out you will get a fairly significant <laughs> amount of of data in let's say a day 24 by 25 right uh, what is that uh, that is a lot <laughs> and then if you multiply that by uh, 365 you get quite a lot of data and there's no problems holding the data locally but maybe it would be too expensive to send it up we'll have to investigate that now there is a saying in big data that you know when you when you have a lot of data try to send your algorithm to the data rather than sending the data to the algorithm so perhaps what we could do is we could develop some kind of algorithm let's just say this is my algorithm and uh, so this well, let's just call it a maybe what I can do is I can take this and I can send that down to here instead oops that didn't work out let's do it again uh, what would that be like this break a little arrow <laughs> so maybe I can send the algorithm down to the protexo unit and then have the protexo unit calculate or evaluate the data that comes from the um, you know that we can gleam out of the data and then instead what we could do is we could create these events whenever we see something interesting and we can send that up to you know the head office so that was the original use case can we do that um, there are some rules here for example if we're going to put a machine like that out here the, this network that they have that connects up all the the um, all the transformer station cannot be actually physically connected to the internet obviously we want an isolation of that net from the internet and you know a lot of software that we install and patch and update we kind of depend on the internet so we had to figure out some way of doing this offline but that's a longer story I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that for now but there's a lot of security things that we had to resolve and so now what we have is a slightly different idea or not a different idea but we have a, a new idea here that we will create these protexo units and we put them in these huts and we would have the ability to send algorithms down to the uh, the huts so even if we have you know thousands of these or millions of these if you wanted to but in in our case it's as I said about 2,000 of them um, is is what this particular power company has what we can then do is from a central location let's let's draw that as a little building maybe this is a big building I don't know so this is their head office let's say it looks something like this so head office maybe from this building what I can do is I can take this algorithm and I can send it down to each one of these machines and have them come and report back to me something at a very high level right we can even have them uh, read, or, you know, eagerly send information to us when they discover something so how do we actually manage this well there are different ways we could do this we can get this software installed and we can collect the data and do things and we could do so manually but it turns out to be quite hard when we're offline and so on so one of our first thoughts is to say okay well there are a ton of things open source things here but if you have a set of machines here doesn't that really form a cluster can I create a, 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 a think of it as a, a as a cluster out of this what if I put all these machines together and had them communicate could I then think of this for example as a Kubernetes cluster okay so there's my 
Kubernetes, often start, start, uh, just K8, right, Kubernetes. What if I put these machines together in a Kubernetes cluster? Now it gets interesting because then the, I, I can think of each machine as having the ability to do something locally, process the data locally, but also be able to collaborate with all the other machines. So this is one of the things that we, I mean, that, that is maybe a little bit unique about the situation is we don't want to think of the machines here or, or the, the sites here as simply in isolation on what they do locally. So this is often called edge computing. But we also want to tie these machines together so that they form a cluster and then they can collaborate. So one way that I think you can think of that is let's see, um, oops, <laughs> let's say we we think of each machine, so this would be the machine that sits inside the cluster or in on each site. If you can think of this machine as having two responsibilities, right? So think of it as we split this machine in two. One responsibility is to the, you know, the PLC and all of these things that are external. Maybe there was a door sensor, I don't know, or maybe there is all kinds of other things that we connect to here. And you'll see it's quite a few things we connect to when we when we discover this opportunity. So the, let's say the red things here are sort of things that are on the outside. What if we think of all this local processing or, and collection of data and so on as as one responsibility that this box has? So let's draw that in yellow. Um, so we say this yellow responsibility is something that this machine has locally. But then some part of this machine should be dedicated to the cluster. You can think of it as two completely separate machines, but it turns out there is a great advantage to looking at them as, or, or putting it on the same machine. So um, the kind of functionality that you get in in the local machine here is maybe you you, you take all these events and you, you translate them. You, maybe you create some kind of event bus, oh, something like this. Uh, some kind of event bus that you publish this on that is local. Maybe you have some kind of forward chaining rule system that sit in here and reads this and figure out if there's something interesting to do. And then this, maybe there is some kind of forwarder, let's just call it forwarder, that says this is an event that I think is very important that I need to send to the rest of the world, right? That I need to make sure that my head office um, performs, right? And this head office now, we can do some trickery here, but it's not really important for for this story, but this is the local responsibility that we had earlier. So you can imagine that this one would eventually send it up to the head office. Now what we're going to see is in practical terms, when we talk about this line of sending it to the head office, in for practical purposes, we're actually sending it here, but I'll come back to that in a second. So this means that every machine that sits out on those boxes have the ability to do the local processing and, and making sure that it can gleam whatever inside it needs. Maybe that there is a power spike on the, or you know the transformer is not working correctly, whatever it is. It, and it generates events that we then forward to the head office. Okay. But now take a look at what we really have here. And now let's focus just logically on these boxes. So each one of these boxes that sits out in the field, sits on this transformer station, now look like, oh, let's draw that in black. Um, look like this, right? It had two responsibility. One was the local responsibility that they drew in yellow, and then the uh, responsibility it has to the cluster that I drew in, in, um, in um, green. Now, we have a lot of these, right? We had 2,000 of these. Now this green part here really forms a cluster. Okay, so I'm going to draw this like this, right? And the compute power of that cluster, which is controlled, say, by the head office, is really coming from um, the additional 
resources that each machine have. And they form a cluster. Well, now I can start installing software into that cluster. Now, it physically, it will run on all the machines or on the subset of the machine, but I can start to, to deploy things like, for instance, databases. Right? I can have a database. Maybe I put everything that we have, uh, you know, every interesting thing or what we have gleaned in terms of important information. Maybe I put that in the cluster. All right. So we could use something in Elasticsearch, maybe. Uh, or we could use Kafka. We could use Cassandra, SkillaDB, whatever you want to do. But these are... The, this is a database. We can deploy this, and if this is a Kubernetes cluster, then that is a relatively, you know, I, I, I use the word trivial here as saying that is something that we know exactly how to do. And then we could probably, if we have Elasticsearch here, maybe we want some kind of dashboard, you know, some dashboard that we can see some graphs that are, of what's going on and some, maybe some power or warnings here and so on so some kind of dashboard so we want want that dashboard also and that dashboard could also be deployed in the cluster and it could be connected to to this to this elastic search now physically that means that maybe there's an elastic search running in here and one in here because there's be replicated maybe kibana runs over here but in practical terms uh, we think of that as a, a separate compute era or area, if you want. Uh, no, I got some issues with my machine here, so see if I can get it back. Uh, I think we'll take a little break here and then figure it out. Well, no, I came back, but uh, so there we go. So this is my this is this is sort of the the short story now as soon as we got this uh, cluster in place and we we started to ask you know what are other things that that happens on your um, uh, locally how do you for example know over here that how can we look at this data and figure out this machine needs needs um, uh, maintenance or this generator or <laughs> transformer needs needs maintenance how do I know that well they said okay what we do is we send someone out in the field and listens to the transformer and if we, we if we listen to it we can gleam the fact or we can uh, we can see that or <laughs> hear that this generator is not working correctly. It turns out what they're actually listening to is something called a partial discharge. So we said, okay, well, that's interesting. Maybe what we should do is we should put a, a microphone in here, you know, uh, and then we can listen to the transformer and then we can hook that up here and we can, we, or to this guy, and then it could put information in and we could have some kind of machine learning m model maybe a TensorFlow model that runs here and, and figures out is that do is this a sign of what what they call partial discharge in that case you know we could just then uh, forward that information maybe along with the recording to the cluster well would that be interesting well I said yeah definitely because if you see a some of these stations so let me give you an example so this is in Norway, right? Some of these are way in, 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 are in, in areas that are not that easy to get to, maybe something like this, say, right? Where they're sitting out in the field and, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and it could take hours or to, to get to it. And, you know, it's Norway. The weather isn't always that perfect either. So, yeah, if we could do that, instead of them having to go out every now and then, listen to these 2,000 transformers, you could imagine how many people that requires if you're going to have regular maintenance. We could have someone 24 by 7 listening to that audio stream. Okay, so if we go back to the... Uh, I guess the picture I have here, look at this. We can basically have someone, I mean, so imagine now that 
there, there, every one of these machines have a microphone attached to it, right? And that when they hear something, they can publish uh, from here. They can publish the fact that they have just heard a partial discharge. We can send that up to the cluster, which it turns out you can do with some local trickery, but it really what you're doing is you're sending it up maybe to Elasticsearch, and then we have some kind of alarm that sits over here, say in Kibana or something, and uh, or maybe we use something like Savix or or if we push then these uh, events, maybe create a ticket for the service technician to go out in the field. Okay, so that's the short story. Now, um, next what I'll do is I'll just give you an idea of how powerful such a, a, a grid might be. So, if you look at each one of these machines, on each one of those machines, as I said, we have 2,000 of those. 2,000 of these machines. What we decided to put out here is a an, a, an Asus box. It doesn't really matter. But it's, a, it's a PC. And this PC has um, 32 gigabyte of memory. And it has 2 terabyte hard disk, SSD actually. And it has, uh, uh, each one of them has actually an AI accelerator from uh, some a company called Go uh, Coral, which is owned by Google. So they have uh, one, um, uh, ac uh, let's call it the AI accelerator. Uh, this one would allow us to run machine learning models at a tremendous speed. So it's about, I mean, it would speed up, say, a Raspberry Pi by about 70 times. So it's it's pretty impressive. So that gives us a lot of compute power. You can think of it also as you know, what you would do with a graphics card or so. And, uh, yeah, we have four Intel CPUs, right? That's a four core CPU. Okay, that's what's sitting there. Now you have to multiply that by 2000, right? To see what is the, what is the cluster? Well, some capacity of this is is lost in the process. Let's say we need two gigabyte to run the local processing. That, it actually turns out to be less than that, but let's just say it's, we need two gigabyte. So let's make that 30 times 2000, right? Which is what, 60,000 uh, gigabyte, which in other words is 60 uh, terabyte of memory, distributed memory. Two terabyte uh, that we use for storage. I mean, yeah, there's something is taken up by the operating system, and I'm I'm not gonna uh, bother with that because it's so little. So uh, let's say two gang air two, uh, two thousand gang down two. So that's four thousand uh, terabyte or four petabyte. So four. Yeah. Let me see four petabyte of storage, distributed storage, right? And we have 2,000 accelerators and we have 8,000 CPUs. Now that's a pretty powerful cluster. I mean, that is a data center that you can be proud of. Uh, so as a, if you look at it from, let's say the power companies, let's say you're a data scientist at the power company, right? So, and you're looking at this cluster and you're looking at, um, gleaming some interesting data out of it. Maybe you're running some machine learning model, maybe you're doing some simple analytics. But you now have a 60 terabyte um, memory <laughs> cluster of four petabyte. And let's say we put something like a partial spark in here. You also have all the data stored locally. What you're able to do with this data and the amount of ana analytics that you can do without ever having moved the, the, the data is mind boggling. Okay, so how long would it take us to put together such a cluster? Well, there, there are, it turns out that we can do most of the work, we can do 95% of the work in maybe as little as an hour. But the last 5%, that is the things that we haven't done, like this machine learning model, for instance, or perhaps defining the rules for when you forward information to the cluster, that part, that 
that is completely new would take up most of our work. Right? So we would do that in an hour, but we might spend months building those applications. But it would be a tremendous acceleration. So I'll show you how you can do that next.